Welcome to your Catholic drive time. Keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information. From the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic drive time. And welcome to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Today is Tuesday, June 6, 2023, the Feast of St. Norbert. Born in Xanten around 1080, he led a life of contrast and transformation. Initially drawn to worldly pleasures, Norbert served as a courtier and almoner to a powerful figures. However, a near-death experience during a thunderstorm changed his outlook. This event prompted Norbert to embrace a life of penance and devotion to God. Seeking guidance, Norbert turned to Abbot Kono of Seigberg. Under his direction, Norbert underwent spiritual renewal and founded the Abbey of Furstenberg, generously endowing it with his own property. He commitment, his commitment to his faith deepened, leading him to become a priest. After a retreat in Siegberg Abbey, he celebrated his first Mass and delivered a powerful sermon on the transient nature of worldly pleasures. Throughout his life, Norbert faced challenges. Accused of being an innovator, he resigned from his positions and embraced poverty and humility. He sought counsel from Pope Galatius and was granted the authority to preach. Norbert zealously confronted heresies, converted many, and reconciled enemies. In 1120, at the Pope's request, Norbert founded the Abbey of pre montre and established the Norbertines. The order thrived, and numerous houses founded women from noble families also joined the order. An Archbishop of Magdeburg, Norbert faced challenges in combating heresies, reforming clergy, and promoting peace. He fearlessly defended the true Pope and church authority, and St. Norbert died on June 6, 1134 in Magdeburg, and his body was laid to rest in the Norbertine Abbey of St. Mary, where his tomb became a site of miracles. Norbert was canonized by Pope Gregory the 13th in 1582 and lead a, leaving a behind a legacy of holiness and reform. St. Norbert's life inspires personal conversion and renewal of faith. His devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, tireless preaching, and establishment of a prayerful religious order have left an indelible mark on the church's history. St. Norbert, pray for us. Happy Tuesday to you. Praise be to God. I'm so glad to be here. And, you know, it's very interesting, St. Norbert. I love St. Norbert. Why? Because uh, four of my friends have uh, joined the Norbertine Fathers, specifically in St. Michael's Abbey in Orange County, in the Orange County area. So that's pretty awesome. In fact, my, my buddy Frater Garion is actually in uh, town this week on a visit. So yeah. uh, it's a happy uh, feast day to, to Frater Garion and to all Norbertines on this day. That abbey is bursting with vocations out in Orange County. Yes, and uh, the Dominicans actually have their origins with the Norbertines as well, because St. Dominic, allegedly, according to the Norbertines, uh, St. Dominic was a Norbertine before he went off to join, uh, to create the Dominicans. So, wow. There you go, and that's why the Dominicans have uh, the white habit because St. Dominic had it already from the Norbertines. They just kind of changed it up a little bit. Good so, stuff. Fun facts, fun facts. And uh, joining us right now is Tito Edwards. Good morning, Tito. Good morning, Adrian. What a wonderful day to be alive on God's great green earth. Today is Tuesday, and uh, w there's so many exciting things happening in the world today, especially in the news. And I look forward to the show progressing and uh, un opening everything up that's coming up. Very good. At 15 past the hour, we're going to be discussing the Sacred Heart of Jesus billboard campaign. As it turns out, you may have seen these posts. It's gotten hundreds of uh, retweets on Twitter. It's been shared dozens and dozens of times on Facebook. And so maybe you've seen uh, the Sacred Heart of Jesus billboard campaign somewhere, somehow. Maybe you've seen it in person. And I was uh, realized that it was actually somebody I know that was uh, leading this, uh, this billboard campaign. And so I called her up yesterday and asked her if she would be willing to come on and share her story of how this happened. And so at 15 past the hour, we're going to be talking about that. At 30 past the hour, Mary O'Regan is going to be on with us to discuss the Padre Pio movie. We talked about it yesterday, uh, but I wanted to discuss a little bit further because uh, we want to, we talk about the negative aspects of it, but I want to talk about as well, what is the proper view of Padre Pio? So we're going to talk about that at 30 past the hour. In the next hour, Debbie Giorgiani will be on to discuss the degrees of demonic activity. She's the co-host 
to a, the Spirit World that is produced out of the Guadalupe Radio Network and is broadcast at 10 a.m. Central Time um, every Saturday. So make sure you tune in. In the next hour, we're going to be discussing that. And as always, we have our Fear and Trembling Game Show, and we're going to be giving out prizes as always. So make sure you tune in for that. And you uh, can find our phone number if you want to hop on early, as early as the top of the 7 o'clock hour. You can hop on and check out our phone number. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT to get all that information. Uh, but let's begin with prayer is, is our custom. We're going to be praying this month and the whole month long to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In a special way today, though, I, we've uh, heard word about an hour ago that Pope Francis has gone into the hospital and so we're going to be praying for Pope Francis in a special way, especially if uh, he's almost, he's like 85 years old, 86 years old. So we pray for a holy death if this should be near his death. And uh, according to Bree Dale, about 20 minutes ago, she reported that uh, this way they have not admitted, they have not said that this was a scheduled appointment yet. So they, uh, we believe that perhaps it is uh, a downturn in his health. So Whatever it may be, we were praying for him, and we pray that he have a holy death. Uh, especially during this month of June, we also pray for a smashing of the LGBT heresy and for the virtues of the of humility during this month. Amen. And so all these things we pray. And of course, as always, we pray for our friends, family, and benefactors, and all those that we promise to pray for. And uh, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. My loving Jesus, out of the grateful love I bear thee, and as a reparation for all of my unfaithfulness, I give thee my heart, and I consecrate myself wholly to thee, and with thy aid I propose never to sin again. Heart of Jesus, burning with love for us, inflame our hearts with love of thee. Let us pray, Lord, we beseech thee, let thy Holy Spirit kindle in our hearts that fire of charity, which our Lord Jesus Christ thy Son sent forth from his innermost heart upon this earth and will that it should burn with vehemence, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now your headline news with Tito Edwards. Good morning. You are listening to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. Today is Tuesday, May 6, Anno Domini 2023, and these are your headlines. Catholic News Agency is reporting Carmelite nuns of the Monastery of the Most Holy Trinity in Arlington, Texas, filed new theft and defamation charges Friday against Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth. The nuns' new charges were filed in a district court for Tarrant County, Texas, the day after Olson dismissed the monastery's prioress, Reverend Mother Teresa Agnes Gerlich, from religious life on the grounds that she had a sexual affair with an unnamed priest. Catholic News Agency is reporting Hong Kong police apprehended almost two dozen citizens for seditious activity on the 34th anniversary of the Chinese Communist government's massacre of citizens at Tiananmen Square, according to the Hong Kong Free Press. The Hong Kong Free Press reported that 11 men and 12 women ages 20 to 74 were detained in an apparent crackdown on Tiananmen Square memorials over the weekend in Hong Kong. Catholic News World is reporting on June 5th, Pope Francis named three scholars, including a Chinese critic of political equality and leading Australian theologian to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Sciences. Members who need not be Catholic are appointed to tenured terms on the basis of their competencies in the social sciences and of their moral integrity. And finally, Crux is reporting Sacramento Diocese shocked as migrants abandoned at Pastoral Center. The f- they were dropped off f- via flights from to Sacramento, appear similar to a flight the state of Florida funded last year that brought 49 migrants to Martha's Vineyard and Upscale Island off the coast of Massachusetts. Those were your headlines this morning. God bless you all. The Gospel of the Day comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. Then they sent some of the Pharisees to him and those who were of Herod's party to make him betray himself in his talk. These came and said to him, Master, we know that thou art sincere, that thou holdest no one in awe, making no distinction between man and man, but teachest in all sincerity the way of God. Is it right that tribute should be paid to Caesar, or should we refuse to pay it? 
But he saw their treachery and said to them, Why do you thus put me to the test? Bring me a silver piece and let me look at it. When they brought it, he asked them, Whose is this likeness? Whose name is inscribed on it? Caesar's, they said. Whereupon Jesus answered them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were lost in admiration of him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Lord. Now, the commentary here comes from St. Thomas Aquinas in his Katana Aurea. He says, The chief priests, though they sought to take him, feared the multitude, and therefore they endeavored to effect what they could not do of themselves by means of earthly powers, that they might themselves appear to be guiltless of his death. And therefore it is said that they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. We have said elsewhere of the Herodians that they were, cer- they were a certain new heresy who said that Herod was the Christ because the secession of the kingdom of Judah had failed. Others, however, said that the Herodians were the soldiers of Herod, whom the Pharisees brought as witnesses of the words of Christ, that they might take him and lead him away. But observe how in their wickedness they wished to deceive Christ by flattery. For it goes on, Master, we know that thou art true. Now notice how often this would this happen to you and I, that people may try to flatter you in order to deceive you, in order to get you to trip yourself up. And this is why we have to be careful of flattery. They, it goes on and says, but the bland and crafty question was intended to induce him in his answer, rather to fear God than Caesar. And to say that tribute should not be paid so that the Herodians immediately on hearing this might hold him to be the author of sedition against the Romans. And therefore they added, and carest for no man, for they regardest not the person of any, so that thou wilt not honor Caesar, this is against the truth. Therefore they added, but teach us the way of God true in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? For the whole plot was one which, which had a, pre- a precipice on both sides, so that if he had said that it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar, they might provoke the nation and the people against him, as though he wished to reduce the nation itself to slavery. But if he said that it was not lawful that they might accuse him, as though he was stirring up the people against Caesar, the fountain of wisdom escaped their snares. Wherefore there follows, But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. A denarius now was a piece of money, accounted to equal to ten smaller coins, and bearing the image of Caesar. Wherefore there follows, and he saith unto them, Whose is his image and subscription? They said to him, Caesar. So that those who think that our Savior asked the question out of ignorance and not by economy, learn from this that he might have known whose image it was, but he puts the question in order to return them a fitting answer. Therefore it follows that Jesus answering them said unto them, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. For if he had said, Give what bears an image to those whose image it bears, that is, the penny to Caesar, for we can both pay Caesar his tribute and offer to God what is his own, that is, the tithes, the first fruits, the oblations, the victims, in the same way he gave tribute both for himself and Peter. Now render to Caesar the money bearing his image, which is collected for him, and render yourselves willingly up to God for the light of thy countenance, O Lord, and not as Caesar's is stamped upon it. The inevitable wants of our bodies is as Caesar's unto each of us. The Lord therefore orders that there should be given to the body its own, that is food and remnant, and to God the things that are God. It goes on, and they marveled at him. That who ought to have believed wondered at such great wisdom because they had found no place for their craftiness. Now, to summarize what St. Thomas here said, it is good to give to the government what belongs to the government. In fact, it is good to give to anybody what belongs to them. That is the virtue of justice, to render unto someone what is due to them. So if we have just taxes, you pay the just taxes. Now, when we give unto God, what? belongs to God. Well, it is our very soul. It is our very selves. So we give to God everything. So when he says, look at the, we look at your money, whose image is on it? Well, then give to the government, the government's money. But what are you stamped with? Oh, we are stamped with the Imago Dei, the image of God himself. And therefore we render our very selves unto God Almighty. We'll be right back with more after this. 
Maidani, who was the first pope to whom Jesus said, you are the rock upon which I will build my church? St. Peter. And who is the current pope? Pope Francis. As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children. And if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. You know, before we jump into this conversation, I just want to uh, let you just update you on this situation here with uh, Pope Francis. Uh, so Bree Dale, about 40 minutes ago, posted, it's nearing 1230 in, in Rome. The Vatican uh, Bulletin has been published without mention of the Pope's visit to Gamilly, which is the hospital. No statement from the Holy See press office. Previously, when the Pope has been admitted in the hospital, the official word was first that it was for a, quote, scheduled appointment. He said with the Pope in his mid 80s, one would think that there's a standard of protocol of preemptively notifying accredited press corps of scheduled medical appointments. And so it is very concerning. It was about an hour ago when it was reported that he was uh, in the hospital. So let's pray that if uh, this be close to the Holy Father's death, that he have a holy death. So we're praying for that intention today. And I'll keep you updated. It's If anything gets updated while the show's going on, I will let you know. Uh, but joining us right now is Ruby Galatolo. Uh, she has an amazing story. I found out, I saw these posters, or these pictures rather, of these billboards of the Sacred Heart of Jesus uh, being shared all over the internet, over Twitter, Facebook, and all over the place that people were sharing it on Instagram. And I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. And then I found out that it was from somebody that I knew. So I had to get a hold of Mrs. Galatalo and ask her about the story. And she's telling me this, and I'm just blown away at how inspiring it was. So good morning to you, Mrs. Galatalo. Good morning, Mr. Adrian. How are you? Oh, it's so good to, that, uh, to have you on. It's a good morning. Absolutely. Uh, so let's start from the beginning who is, uh, so how did this happen? How did you get this idea to start setting up these images of the Sacred Heart uh, for, the, uh, for, this, for this month? Yeah, thank you, Adrian, for having me and helping um, promote the idea. It, it really, I, I am very humbled <laughs> um, at how much, um, you know, people have really responded and, uh, reacted and, and really want to, to do this in their own local area. So it started um, last year, actually, uh, June of 2022, I was uh, driving to my local grocery store, my local Publix here in Florida in Ocala. And Ocala is a pretty conservative city for the most part. So you don't really see um, the Pride Month uh, being promoted much around our city, at least not out in public, unless you step into a Target or a Walmart. Um, so I was really bothered because I was going to my grocery store and there was the billboard right across the street. <clears throat> and I saw a Celebrate Pride Month, um, you know, ad on there. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm like this, you know, I just really uh, bothered by it because as Catholics, we all know that the month of June is devoted to the Sacred Heart. Mm. And we've known this for centuries, you know, since the 17th century. And I'm like, you know, we need to start promoting what June really is. And, and it, that's when the idea immediately came to me. Why don't we do a billboard <laughs> that, mm. you know, lets people know what June really is dedicated to, what we should be, um, you know, promoting. And so it was already June when I saw this, uh, obviously, last year. So I didn't even think about doing it right away, you know, but I said, you know, next year, I, I really would love to find out how much it would cost to do a billboard. I have no idea. I've never done this before, but I know that it's not a new idea. I have, um, I know people and organizations that do pro-life billboards. I think most of us have seen them, um, you know, in our different local areas. And so at least here, we do see a lot of pro-life um, billboards. And so, the idea didn't leave me. I prayed about it. And um, Holy Week this week, it was kind of 
you know, itching at me, like, you know, we're right around the corner from June. If I really want to do this, I need to look into it. And I drove by to see how do I even start? And I saw that the company names are usually on the bottom of the billboard. So I went to the same exact billboard that I saw last year. And I saw that it was um, a clear channel. So I said, well, let me uh, look up on the internet, Google, um, a phone number, a contact. So I did. I just called them and they called. Then I left a message. They called me back. A uh, sales rep from Orlando called me back. And I said, you know, I would like to uh, put up a billboard. I explained what I wanted to do. And he, he sounded very excited about it. Um, and he said, oh, wow, that would be, you know, that's awesome. And so I got a, uh, like a sense that he was a, at least a Christian, but I wasn't sure. And um, he said, okay, you know, he sent me his proposal. And when um, I looked at the proposal, I said, you know, this, this is doable. I think maybe between, you know, a couple of friends, maybe we can split the cost. It was like $1,700 hmm. for that one particular one. And I was meeting my sister, my husband, you know, and my family for lunch. And my sister said, well, you know, why don't you send it out to a few people? I'm sure you, you can find, you know, th there'll be a lot of people that would like to go in on this, you know. So I said, okay, you know, and I did. I just, that night, late at night, like at 10.30 p.m., I forwarded that proposal so people can see, you know, um, that I had already looked into this. I knew what it would cost. And I, I send it out to all my local friends, especially the, you know, mostly the active Catholics that I, I knew. Um, and it, I think it was like 10 30 PM. And by 11 PM, I immediately was getting responses within a minute. And I had like $800 in commitments wow. from people like, you know, count me in for a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. you know, by the next morning, by the time I woke up, we had, like two thousand dollars, we were ready for the for, for one billboard, but we had surpassed that goal. And I said, "Oh wow!" And I, I remember, like my my dad was here uh, staying with us at the time, and and I was so excited at that time. My husband was already sleeping, but I was like, "Dad, you know, people are like, you know, I already have this much money for the billboard, and uh, praise God, you know, I think we're gonna be able to do this." So. Um, it was actually the tritium, um, it, like it was like Holy Wednesday mm -hmm. when I looked into it. And then, so I didn't get back to uh, the sales rep. And Monday morning, he, I kind of even, you know, he called me back and he said, hey, Ruby, you know, um, what, you know, are you still interested? I said, yeah, actually, you know, I'm sorry. I, I was, you know, the last three days. And that's when I found out he was Catholic. He says, well, oh, I'm wow. a Roman Catholic, you know, so that was, um, that was really good, you know, because I, I felt comfortable immediately working with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, I told him, I said, Brian, I think we have enough um, to maybe start looking into a second billboard because now I'm just continuing to get responses. And then people were forwarding my email to other people. Mm. And I was getting uh, people I didn't even know um, from, you know, I live in the center of the state of Florida and people are in the panhandle. I live like six hours away. We're contacting like so and so. Send me your email. I would like to donate. I'm putting the check in the mail this morning. You know. Oh wow. Um. Yeah. Just like that. And then I had another lady <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, so and so told me you were doing this. I would really like to donate. And I said, okay, sure, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the next day she sees me at church and gives me an envelope. And then I open up the envelope and it's a $500 check. Wow. And I was just like, this is incredible. So we ended up raising eight, like over $8,500, uh, which got us three billboards. One was a pretty expensive because it was right in the heart of downtown Orlando on uh, like a highway overpass, the 408. Uh, but after talking to a few of the donors, uh, some of them were from friends from Orlando, um, which is about an hour south of us. And uh, they, they suggested, you think we can get one down there? And I said, absolutely. And, you know, at, we we looked into it and, and we could have gotten either two in other locations or that one because um, it seems like the billboards are more like a real estate location. They're priced differently according right, to the area right. and how much viewing they're going to get. Um, so, yeah, so we. So what was kind of the ahead. reaction that you received from it? Do you have you kind of received positive uh, reactions or has there been negative backlash? What about the area? Yeah. Has so, uh, the yeah. LGBT so, mob come after you yet? 
No, you know, okay, so Adrian, you know, when I made that first phone call, there was a gut feeling that the enemy would not be happy. When This was when we were just looking at doing one billboard locally. You know, I said, I had a gut feeling, but, you know, I know I'm a cradle Catholic, and I know that we can never allow fear to dictate, you know, our actions, because you can always be afraid of what the negative reaction or the backlash. Um, and so far, you know, me personally, um, you know, it's been all positive, all positive. I have not gotten any single negative reaction. I will say that um, the sales rep that has been working with us uh, got kidney stones as he was getting bombarded by other friends and people that were contacting me. And he was, he's, you know, their company's nationwide. So they, he can get billboards within 15 minutes. He has the heart work. So within 15 minutes, he can get a, one of these uh, beautiful images of the sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary up um, all over the nation. And so um, I, you know, he had to be hospitalized. He had kidney stones and, you know, so pray for, I, you know, I asked others to please pray for him because I, mm-hmm. I am pretty sure that, you know, this is all, part of the en- enemy's tactics, you know, to try to put whatever he can <laughs> to stop. Absolutely. Um, the promotion Absolutely. Of and what, um, well, if yeah. someone else, because there's so many stories, uh, I mean, everybody feels this way during the month of June, especially. Um, what do you think uh, if someone was like, you know what, I'm inspired. I want to do something like this. Uh, what's that like? What should do step one? So I told you exactly how, it, you know, how this mm-hmm. was inspired. Our, and I will say Our Lady inspired this. I am, I have no doubt right now <laughs> that she's really behind this. Um, and, and uh, you know, I will add, like I told you yesterday, Adrian, when we were talking, I went out for a walk with my husband to pray the rosary. And I said, if only I had a, you know, as I started receiving all these positive responses from people, I said, if only I had a billion dollars, how many billboards can I get all <laughs> over the country? And Little did I know, Our Lady did not need the billion dollars. She could do it without it, and she did. She's doing it, you know. But I think the first step is to make a list of, you know, all your local friends, family that you know. You know, I think, it. you know, I have friends that called me and said, hey, I heard you're doing this. This is great, and I want to do one. And now yesterday I talked to a friend in Milwaukee, my friend Dean Weimer, and they're getting five billboards, and she had to, like, cap the fundraiser wow. because, you know, yeah, because, you know, there was so awesome. much, they were getting enough money, you know, so I think just um, they can, uh, you know, I definitely uh, you can contact the, your, the companies that are in your area, billboard companies, mm-hmm. you can just kind of do a search. It, the, my sales rep can definitely help if uh, they want to call me. Uh, I can guide them in that direction. You can send, you know, you can send them my number. If anybody contacts you, you can feel Absolutely. free to send them my phone number and I can, I can guide them to, to them. And then he could send, you know, you tell them what area and he can send you a proposal for all the, like within a mile radius, okay. within a mile or two mile radius, they, he'll send you a map of where exactly they're located. So you can see it on a map. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're just out of time now. Uh, but thank you very much, Mrs. Galatalo, for sharing that wonderful story. And I know, especially during this month, we have to realize that it's not enough to resist the LGBT mob. But we also have to present a positive vision of the future. And that is the reign of Christ the King and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But we'll be right back with more after this. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Because Jesus said in Matthew 23 that no one should be called rabbi, father, or teacher, I'm sure you would never call one of your teachers teacher, would you? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a Catholic no-no, calling a priest father. Well, what about Paul calling Timothy, Titus, and Onesimus his sons? No doubt his spiritual sons, but is it not proper for a spiritual son to call his spiritual father father? This reverential title should never have generated such a big point of contention. 
Revelation. Secondly, in the New Testament, in Acts 7 and Romans 9, we see the term father being used referring to Abraham and some of our great patriarchs. And my take, isn't context everything? When Jesus is speaking to the multitudes, it's oftentimes in the language and style of hyperbole. His discourse was not focused on titles or ecclesiastical guidelines. Jesus was once again warning against giving honor where honor is not due. Next time you see your pastor, just say, hey, preacher, uh, that just seems so lacking. I've been listening to Guadalupe Radio for a couple years now, and I think it was a bumper sticker I saw on somebody's car one time, and it's a radio station that I don't have to be concerned about or worried about. When the kids and I are driving, I don't have to worry about inappropriate items. It's just the opposite. It's educational. I've learned so many different topics and on different subjects that I couldn't believe being a Catholic and being baptized as a child. There's so many things I didn't know, and now in these past couple years that I've been listening in, I've learned so much. Welcome back to the Catholic Drive Time Show. Today is Tuesday, May 6, 2023, and these are your headlines for this morning. Catholic News Agency is reporting the state of Oklahoma approved the country's first ever religious charter school on Monday. The move will allow public funds to pay the tuition of children attending an online Catholic school run by the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City and the Diocese of Tulsa. The statewide virtual charter school board voted 3-2 to approve St. Isidore Seville Catholic Virtual School in a three-hour-long meeting. The yes votes included a new member who was appointed by Republican Governor Kevin Stitt on Friday. Catholic World News and TAZ are reporting Moscow no plans yet for papal envoys visit. While Cardinal Matteo Zuppi is in Kiev this week for peace talks, a Russian government spokesman says that the papal envoy has not yet scheduled a visit to Moscow. The spokesman, the spokesman for Russian President Vladimir Putin told reporters that the Russian leader expected to hear from Cardinal Zuppi after the prelate's visit to Kiev. As for a subsequent trip to Moscow, he said, we will inform you if it is penciled in. Crux is reporting in the wake of one of the deadliest train crashes in India's history in which at least 288 people have been killed and more than 1,000 injured when three trains collided. The Catholic Diocese in the area of the disaster has plunged into rescue and relief operations. The response from the church side was immediate as priests and parishioners in and around Balasore got actively involved with the rescue operations, says Father Roy Kochuparako director of social services for the Diocese of Balasore, located in the eastern Indian state of Odisha, where the crash occurred. And finally, Live Sight News is reporting an Oklahoma mother is suing her local school district after a 17-year-old transgender student allegedly severely beat her 15-year-old daughter in the girl's bathroom. The lawsuit accuses Edmond School District of failing to enforce a law signed by Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt on May 25th that requires Oklahoma public school students to use restrooms that match the sex on their birth certificates. According to the police report, the transgender student assailant became angry with the victim after she refused to answer a question telling the male student she didn't want to speak to him and why, according to Fox News. I am Tito Edwards, and these are today's headlines through a Catholic lens. Thank you, Tito, for keeping us up to date. And just a moment, we're going to be discussing more with the about the Padre Pio movie. There's always something to talk about when it comes to uh, Padre Pio. He's a wonderful saint. In fact, he's actually my confirmation saint. So even though I am a Dominican at heart, uh, my confirmation saint is, in fact, a Franciscan. I know, it's scandalous, very scandalous, really. Uh, to be fair, in my defense, I didn't know much about the Dominicans whenever I was in, uh, when I was getting confirmed, which is a story for another day, because I also went to St. Thomas High School. So you're thinking, how does that work that you didn't know who the Dominicans were when you went to a school named after a Dominican? Kind of strange, right? So we're going to have that conversation in just a little bit. Um, but before we do, there is one story that I wanted to cover that I found to be incredibly concerning. And I'm just going to read to you the headline. And if we have time, we'll discuss further. And if we don't have time today, we're definitely going to bring this back up because this is a massive deal. So 
and Kansas City, the archbishop has let the uh, faithful know that some priests were offering invalid masses for a very long time. And in fact, to make uh, matters worse, not only was this happening, but the, the reason why it was invalid was because they were using invalid matter. So for a, the sacraments to be valid, a priest has to use proper form and matter, meaning he has to use bread and wine. If he fails to use bread and wine, then it's not a valid mass and you do not attend mass. So even if the valid matter was used for the bread, for the body, for the, the consecration of the host, if the invalid matter was used for the precious blood, for the wine, for the body and blood of our Lord under the species of wine, if the invalid matter is used there, you do not offer the sacrifice because the priest, it is required that the priest consume the victim, consume Christ. And so the sacrifice did not happen. So for years, there was no masses being said. And for everyone who had intentions, who was paying for, who was uh, giving donations for stipends for masses to be said for different reasons, none of those were happening. None of those happened. This is a very, very concerning situation. The, the pillar put this out. They says the archbishop of Kansas City has warned priests that they could be offering mass with invalid matter and they should ensure their altar wine is both free from additives and especially vented for sacramental use. The archbishop wrote to priests on May 31st to warn that he had recently learned of parishes and notice parishes with a S at the end using wine that would invalidate their attempts to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass. It goes on and says it has recently been reported by two priests having served in three different parishes that upon their appointment to these parishes, they soon discovered the long term use of wines that are in fact invalid matter for the confection of the Eucharist. Archbishop Joseph Nauman noted in a May 31st letter obtained by the pillar. As a result, he wrote in those parishes for any number of years, all masses were invalid and therefore the intentions for which those masses were offered were not satisfied, including the obligation pastors have to offer mass for the people. This is a gravely serious situation, which we must now petition the Holy See for guidance on restorative matters. I don't know how you restore this matter. This is a uh, very, very concerning. This, there's just so much here that I don't even know where to even begin. Now, there is much more that could be said about this and much more that will be said about this. But the thing that I want to kind of take away from this, and we'll, we'll discuss this further uh, probably tomorrow, is the fact that I, I just do not go to churches. I, I, I don't go to churches where there are priests that I don't know personally because I just don't know. I just don't. I, it's a, it's a, it feels like a sad thing to say and a very bad thing to say. But I don't trust a lot of these priests because I don't know what their formation was like. Maybe they're great. I have no idea. I'm not judging them negatively. I'm just having a sense of skepticism because we hear all the time of stories like this where priests are doing crazy things. And when the story came out, a number of people reached out to me and they're telling me, oh, yeah, I, I was told by a priest, a friend of mine, who when he opened the tabernacle at a new church he went to for the first time, that there were chips in the tabernacle, that they were using chips instead of, instead of hosts. This is absurd. And someone else was telling me that they had welches in the fridge where they, where they normally would keep the wine. There is uh, so many stories like this that I hear constantly, constantly popping up. This is very, very concerning. And this is why I simply just avoid going to churches where I don't know the priest, where I'm not familiar with the practice of the priest and with the knowledge of the priest. And I, I know that sounds, that sounds bad, but simply due to the situation we find ourselves in in our day, we have to just be skeptical. We have to listen. This is the burden of being Catholic in the 21st century. 
the burden of being Catholic in our day. Every age has their mar- has their crosses. Every age has a period where there is going to be great turmoil and requires extra virtue, a specific virtue for that time. And the virtue that we have to have in our day is vigilance and study. Because we as Catholics do not have the benefit of the doubt. We do not have the benefit of being able to just say, whatever Father says is the way to go. Whatever the bishop says is the way to go. I'm just going to be obedient to my priest and my bishop, and I am set. We don't have that luxury in our time. Instead, we have to be vigilant about what is going on around us. We have to be able to be watching. We can't just ease into a malaise, and we can't have a spirit of slothfulness. Instead, we have to be vigilant about what father is doing, what the bishop is doing, what people at the parish are doing, and we have to be educated because we need to know the faith We have to know the right way the sacraments are to be done. We have to be able to know the words that need to be said. These are the things that have to happen because if they do not happen, if the father says the wrong thing, this will invalidate our sacraments. And I know personally priests, and they're not these rad trad priests. They're very normal priests. And they would tell me, they said, Adrian, When you go to confession, make sure you listen to the words that the priest says that he uses the right form of absolution because there are many priests who do not use the right form of absolution. They make it up themselves. And this would invalidate your confession. And this goes across the board for all the sacraments. It's a sad situation we find ourselves in, but it's a real situation we find ourselves in. We can't just bury our heads in the sand and pretend everything is hunky-dory because it's not. We have to be vigilant and we have to have the burden of being educated in our faith. Well, this is why it's good that you listen to Catholic Radio. It's good that you tune in here, but you should be going beyond that as well. And there are a lot of great books out there. Maybe some courses that should be taken, but we have to be girded in our faith. We'll be right back with more after this. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Have you ever thought, well, why can't a prayer at a Catholic Mass cause the Holy Spirit to come upon the bread and wine and thus turn it into the actual body and blood of Jesus? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, remember, three of the most magnificent miracles were a result of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone or something such as the Holy Spirit came upon the face of the deep and God created the world. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she brought forth Jesus in her womb. Secondly, a a boatload of scriptural support, such as 1 Corinthians 10, 16, which says the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And thirdly, my honest reflection, your transformation after a prayer for conversion was not and is not noticeable in the human eye. So then why do you reject a prayer which transforms bread and wine into Jesus' body and blood? I know the reason, just a whole bunch of people have told you that. Hey, Donnie, who were the first two people God created? Adam and Eve. There you go. And what did we inherit from them? Original sin. As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children. And if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. Before we jump into this conversation, I just wanted to give you an update on what's happening with Pope Francis. So Catholic News Agency just put an article saying that Pope Francis spent about 40 minutes at Gamelli Hospital for a checkup on Tuesday morning, media reports say. That'd be today. Um, and Bridell responded to this and has a quote tweeted it and said that the Holy See press office has not responded to any inquiries, nor has there any statement been issued as of 1338 and their time in Italy time. A head of state age 80 plus is taken to the hospital and no preemptive notice to press. Hmm. Question mark. So it is interesting. It's something that we should definitely keep in our prayers. 
Um, and Bree Dale's not one to uh, be a rumor monger or to jump onto things in, uh, that are not substantiated. And yeah. she's simply asking questions at the moment. She's a real but professional. It's, uh, but it's good to uh, to keep in mind uh, what's going on and to see, to watch, and to see what's happening. So we'll just keep you updated as things happen. I'm sure we'll know something more to by tomorrow. Uh, but for right now, uh, what we know is the Holy Father went to the hospital for about 40 minutes at a unplanned quote unquote checkup. Um, so we'll find out I'm sure soon uh, what the deal is. Uh, but joining us right now is Mary. Um, good morning to you, Mary. Good morning, Adrian. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it was a uh, very interesting, the, the Padre Pio movie. We talked about it a little bit yesterday and the situation with this movie immediately got a lot of backlash um, because people were very excited about the movie and they were expecting it to be a great portrayal of Padre Pio, but it doesn't seem that that's exactly what we got. Are you familiar with, uh, did you see the movie or uh, are you familiar with what happened? Yes, I did see the movie. And so what were your thoughts about the portrayal of uh, Padre Pio, yesterday we mentioned of a lot of the concerning things that were happening in the movie and why we as Catholics should definitely not see it. Uh, but what about just the portrayal of Padre Pio in general? Well, I think that Shia LaBeouf does an absolutely amazing job. I think that he is ruggedly handsome, as Padre Pio was. He has that same charisma. You see, I'm borrowing from I'm 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 a I'm a Padre Pio author. Um, I'm hoping to publish with ten books who are very interested in the book. And but I came to know Padre Pio as a teenager when he appeared to me twice. And when I was seventeen, I had I, when I was fourteen and then seventeen, um, I had an experience of meeting Padre Pio, and I feel that Shia, in his conversion to Catholicism, definitely embodies the holiness of Padre Pio in his portrayal of Padre Pio for the most part. Where the film lets us down is in regards to the in, in regards to the person of the devil. The person of the devil, um, as portrayed in the film, is not what happened with Padre Pio. And if I may jump right in, Adrian, as it were, um, the devil did attack Padre Pio um, with merciless temptations in the first eight years of Padre Pio's priesthood. So, folks, this would be from the time that Padre Pio was 23 to 31. Padre Pio was subject to absolutely ferocious temptations. And the film mostly borrows from a, just a few weeks. It makes it seem as though some certain temptations that were visited on Padre Pio in a few weeks were visited on him um, these are on, there's only a sampling of the temptations that were visited on Padre Pio in the film. But Padre Pio was visited by the devil who came to him as a woman dancing, dancing naked and dancing lustfully. But in the film, the, the devil approaches a picture of Our Lady and um, actually acts in a sexual manner towards that picture. But Padre Pio was adamant that um, Our Lady is the one who crushes the head of Satan, and it's it would be it, that did not happen. The devil mm. did not the devil did not kiss an image of Our Lady in a sexual manner. Uh, that did ne that never happened in the life of Padre Pio because Padre Pio was adamant that saying the Rosary makes Our Lady present. Our Mary is present in every decade of the rosary, and whenever he was attacked by the devil, he clutched his rosary. And that does not happen as much in the film as it needs to happen. Hmm. And you see, when, when you have the devil um, acting sexually towards a picture of Our Lady, it undermines that, which is our greatest protection, um, to put ourselves under her mantle. Yeah, and that's very concerning, and especially, I mean, any kind of, if they're depicting it, that means they actually did it, and that is uh, sacrilegious and blasphemous. And should be, uh, and for that reason alone, uh, Catholics should avoid this movie. But and so this brings up an interesting point. Uh, Aladia put out an article on this on this movie, and in it they said that that this is a quote from their article. This is Abel's way of showing that Padre Pio was yes, he was holy, but he was also a sinner. 
This is in his early 20s. He's going through his struggles. There's a passage in one of Padre Pio's letters to his spiritual director saying, I'm having difficulties with my passions, with lust. I lied one time as a priest. I'm having difficulties with my temper. It's there. Uh, what would your response be to that uh, quotation there from Aladia? Well, I think that we're talking about a specific time period in Padre Pio's life when, the stig- when, he, when he had the stigmata, and yet it was invisible. He had prayed that the stigmata would be made invisible. We're talking about one eight-year period in Padre Pio's life uh, that is not representative of his whole priesthood, because when he accepted the visible stigmata, Christ comes to him as a, when he's when he's 31, and he accepts the visible stigmata. Christ wounds him, and the wounds will not become invisible again. The devil loses all power to tempt Pio at that point, and that was noted. That was categorically noted by his spiritual directors that the ending of the film has has Sheila Buff in the in the role of Padre Pio receiving the visible stigmata. But we're talking about the fact that he was a young priest, and I would not like people to think that this was his spirituality for the entirety of his life, because something that's a preoccupation in my book about Padre Pio is that he had graduations in the spiritual life. His life is always mystical milestone after mystical milestone. And he had these tremendous graduations. But before he gets the visible stigmata at 31, he's absolutely excoriated by demonic temptations for the eight years before that, from the age of the 23 to 31. And that had the role of humbling him. And that's actually one of the good things about the film. You see Shia LaBeouf acts very, very well as this priest who is very, very highly favored. Padre Pio was awesomely highly favored. And yet, He's becoming more and more humble. But um, the film also falls down in the fact that it has Pio using curses against the devil. Again, the devil comes in the form of a woman, when in fact, in real life, the devil came in the form of a man. Hmm. A man of a highly sophisticated, extraordinarily handsome, um, debonair man who was able to give the most sophisticated answers as to why he had sinned. Padre Pio realized he was the um, realized he was Satan and asked him to say, long live Jesus, long live Mary. He wouldn't say it and he disappeared. That's what happened in real life. In the film, the devil is a woman and Pio is using they put the F word in the mouth of Pio and Pio would not have used language that the devil would want him to use. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, I think about myself and I'm like, I am not a, a holy man by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, simply go ask my uh, my family. Uh, they'll let you know. They'll give you a list. Uh, but one vice I do not have is I, I do not have a very uh, foul mouth. And I'm thinking to myself, if I can go without cursing, then of course Padre Pio could go without cursing because people were like, oh, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. He's Italian. That's like a normal thing. Um, what would you say to that? Well, I would say that um, Padre Pio was brought up by his mother, and she would, he thought she thought him that cursing was a crime, that hmm. he was to exempt himself from the company of anyone who cursed. And, um, I mean, I was brought up in Ireland. I was brought up in Ireland with children who were quite filthy mouths. Um, I'm from County Cork, um, and I can't say that I've never cursed, so I'm, I can't, um, I can't, um, Mm -hmm. I doesn't say I'm not, I'm not in a position, but at the same time, it's just not the, 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 it misses an opportunity by putting the F word into Padre Pio's mouth. It, it, it misses that opportunity when, because Padre Pio relied always on the holy name. He would ask the devil, he would ask the devil who he suspected was a devil to say the holy name. And either um, Satan or one of his satellites could never utter the name of the Savior. And that's how Pio would know. So it misses an opportunity to tell the viewer what actually really happened. And it actually would have been much more dramatically moving had they put the the, the Savior's name, had Jesus, in, in that moment when he's ousting, instead of the F word again, um, 
because mm-hmm. I don't think we see we see that throughout the movie that Pio does use that recourse. He does ask the demons to say. We're just about out of time. Before we run out of time, I had a uh, one more thing that I that seems to be a point plot point in the movie, from my understanding, is Padre Pio's relationship between the fascist and the communist. Uh, where is the uh, the historical reality in that story in that uh, kind of relationship? Well, it's actually very unfortunate because it makes it seem that that was all the townspeople when that was only a faction. And the vast majority of the townspeople I'm talking about uh, were very, very holy people who really wanted to support his ministry and weren't so owned by their political allegiances. And we have to remember that the people of San Giovanni Rotondo were much more united together. And they were the ones who stopped Padre Pio from being ousted. They, there was a there was a, a call uh, not long after he gets the stigmata to have him removed from San Giovanni Rotondo and sent away even to Spain, and they gathered round the monastery, they thousands of them. They kept an armed guard and they said, "No, he's not leaving us. We will not have him left." And they were led. They were together. They were united in that. I feel that that is a very unfortunate. I mean, I'm not actually sure of the historic. I don't actually think it's actually that accurate, the portrayal of Mm. that. And it makes it seem as though they were all the townspeople when they were. That was just a faction. And it um, it is. It is very unfortunate. It is representative of the rest of Italy, but not San Giovanni Rotondo, which Padre Pio himself hailed as blessed. Also, it was the spiritual daughter who paid for Padre Pio's train fare to go to San Giovanni in, in the first place. Um, there were people who wanted him to come, and they were the ones who... I'm sorry, Mary. We're just about out of time. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we'll have to have you back in the future to talk about this. Uh, Mary O'Regan, thank you. God bless you. God love you. Have a blessed day. You can find her blog at thepathlesstaken7.blogspot.com. That's thepathlesstaken7.blogspot.com. That's Mary's blog. Uh, God bless you. God love you. And that's going to do it for the first hour. In the next hour, if you can join us, Debbie Giorgiani with The Spirit World is going to be on with us to talk about demonic warfare. Our family had been going through crisis. Little by little, we just found ourselves drifting completely away. I was afraid to go back. I mean, I cried the first time I received the sacraments again cried because I was back and because I had allowed God to become a part of me again. It's united our family. There's peace in our home that we didn't have before. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org today. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Who are the 10 most well-known preachers in America? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Here's the list. Copeland, Osteen, Benny Hinn, Joyce Myers, T.D. Jakes, Stephen Furtick, Andy Stanley, Robert Jeffers, Rick Warren, Alistair Begg, John MacArthur. Well, secondly, all these pastors say the same thing on Sunday morning, which is, turn with me in your Bible. Well, then how's the harmony regarding, say, eternal security, disagreement, present-day ministry of the Holy Spirit, Disagreement. Relationship of baptism to salvation. Disagreement. Church government. Disagreement. Life beginning at conception until natural death. Disagreement. And eschatology. Disagreement. So what's going on here? Well, if you are someone who says, all I need is the word of God, brother, because the Bible is going to give me everything I need to live out the Jesus life. Okay. Hope you've already ditched your favorite blogger, your favorite preacher, your favorite podcaster, and most of all, your religious Google searches. Well, speaking of Google searches, I do request one last Google search for you. Magisterium. I actually was gone from the Catholic Church for 35 years. I want to get to heaven. I don't know if I will. I mean, I worry about it. But I not only want to get to heaven at the moment of my death, I want to find as much heaven as possible here on earth. So I need help. I don't know why I turned on my radio because I've kept my radio off for years. And once I turned it on, I was absolutely hooked. The Guadalupe Radio Network, radio for your soul. Celebrating the culture of life. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. A lot going on this morning. 
a lot of news things going on in the Vatican, things going on with movies, things going on with all sorts of things, with sacraments in Kansas, so many things, so many things, and it, it feels like we're in a situation where there's demonic activity everywhere we go. And on to talk to us about demonic activity is Debbie Giorgiani with 25 years of dedicated service in catechetical ministry and co-hosting the live national radio show, The Spirit World. And Debbie brings a unique perspective on insights on angels, demons, and the intricate relationship between the spiritual and the physical world. You can listen live at 10 a.m. Central Time every Saturday, The Spirit World. But good morning to you, Debbie Giorgiani. Hello, Adrian. Thank you so much for having me on your wonderful show. I thought Mary's interview was amazing. Thank you for bringing her on. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very, very interesting, the situation with uh, the whole Padre Pio situation. And we were kind of touching on the topic of uh, of spiritual warfare. So I think it's very apropos that we have you on immediately after and we talk about this because uh, we're talking about degrees of demonic activity. Padre Pio now received pretty much every degree of demonic activity in his life, uh, short of possession. But um, so tell me about the degrees of demonic activity. Let's start there. What are the degrees of demonic activities? Every person that's involved with demons, are they, are they all possessed? Is everyone possessed? Uh, well, actually, possession is very rare. Um, exorcism ministry, is it, that's not an area that I actually um, focus on. That is actually religious demonologist Adam Bly. Um, he is a he's a paratus in the ministry, which means he's a church decreed expert, and so he um, is in the exorcism ministry on a weekly basis. He's a coach um, to um, uh, priests during the solemn rite of exorcism over a thousand exorcisms. So he's more uh, versed in that area. I actually, Adrian, uh, do the. Um, kind of the the guardian angel side, the angel, the good angels, the holy angels. Um, I do, I specialize in that, uh, studying that, studying that area for 13 years. But uh, like you said, the degrees of demonic activity, you know, you have uh, the kind of the first level where there's that, it, they call it infestation, right? Where there's the, the haunted house type, you know, uh, uh, activity. And, you know, these portals, the demons come in through these portals of various ways and choices that people make, Adrian, when they are dabbling in the occult. OK, so they are opening the doors for these demons to come in and to make make a home and infestation. And then you have, of course, oppression um, where we could we could talk about we could kind of focus on because that's really where a lot of people are struggling between the difference of of depression and mental illness and actual oppression, right? So there's that that area right there. Then there's obsession and then the extreme possession, which is very, very rare. And the reason why Adam and I this weekend, Adrian, that we're going to be discussing again for the third time demonic activity and the levels of demonic activity is because um, we have a lot of um, uh, folks that are emailing us to the spirit world and they're saying, you know, my spouse is a couch potato and I and he, he they won't do anything and they're and they're not participating in in the uh, family activities. I think they might be possessed. And so we really need to cover it because it's just not accurate. So you're saying that when I invite my friend over to mass on a weekday and they're like, eh, I don't want to go to mass, that it's not because they're possessed? <laughs> That's right. Okay. Uh, okay. That's just, right. just wanted to make That's clear right. that. So yeah. in that case, whenever we see things like that, uh, is it typically do we say, okay, there's a huge uh, cleaving right here. It's either demonic activity or not demonic activity, mm -hmm. or is there kind of a, a a middle ground there where we say, well, we know there are people who have temptation, and maybe it's just a temptation mm -hmm. to sloth or temptation to a uh, chidia. Mm -hmm. uh, what say you, Mrs. Giorgiani? Right. Oh, that that's excellent. What you just said, absolutely uh, spot on. And you know, I think there's a there's a real um, 
there's a leaning towards trying to blame everything on the devil. You know, we we have to uh, take um, note of our choices and the things that we are we are saying yes to. We also have to be very aware of where we're at physically and mentally, um, because that plays a huge factor. OK, so it's not always the devil's around the corner type thing. Um, so it, it, that's why it's very important. And that's one of the reasons, boy, you, you zeroed right in on it, Adrian, without maybe you even realizing you did, you did. So At, that's the reason why Adam and I came together to, to do, start the show, uh, a year ago is because we just found that there was, there really wasn't a solid catechesis on this. It wasn't getting out there. And so nobody really knew what to blame the devil, how to blame the devil, when to bring, when to say it was the devil, when not to say. And so we said, there's, this is really going in a bad direction. So we wanted to just really clear things up for folks, calm things down a bit, make people realize that the majority of, of uh, uh, these things that are happening um, may have a, a, uh, an, 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 an uh, it could be aligned with mental illness. Mm. So people need to really go to their doctors first. You know, they need to do that. They need to go ha- go to a good confession. And a lot of this can be can be rectified. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a very good and hopeful note because some people may become scared of the demonic and think that hey, they have no control. And in fact, that's actually the one of the things I did not like about the... Um, the movie Nefarious. I liked it overall. It was 90%. I was like 100%. This is great. I recommend people to watch it. But the one thing that I did not like about it was it seemed as though that this the the man who was possessed had zero free will, that from the earliest days of his life, uh, the devil had possessed him and he had never made a free choice. Uh, he had made all his decisions, everything that led to his uh, time there in prison and to his death was all due to the devil and the devil alone. And I was like, "Mm, I don't know. And so what say you about that? Um, Does the devil take away our free will? Well, no, 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 absolutely not. But I, I want to, I want to share something with you on that because that's interesting. That was one of the things that I learned through working with Adam Bly is um, I, I always thought I was like you shared at the beginning of of uh, introducing me that I've been in religious education for many, many years. And I always thought that people with um, like a compromised, you know, brain health issues and stuff like that, they weren't really um, they, they weren't really like I, I, how, how do you say this free to, you know, free to kind of say yes to letting the devil in. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought, well, they can't really be preyed upon. But that's that's just not true. See the demons. Um, the demons will come in, uh, and remember, everything is permitted by God for the for that person to hopefully get stronger, right? So there's there's an outcome that that is that is um, you know desired. So when that person is fully comp- when that person gets compromised over and over and over again, Adrian, and and what you tapped into with the movie Nefarious, I fe- I sort of felt the same way when I was watching it. Is that is that when a person becomes so compromised, the de- the demons then can um, manifest in that person's body. But you know, here's the thing: it, it's not it doesn't infringe upon the uh, the free will, okay? And it doesn't um, take over the soul. All right. So we have to be. Vi- that's why we have to be very clear on what these levels of demonic activity are, how they impact the body how they how what we can do to get stronger to prevent this and also to make sure it never happens uh to us in the future is is very important so you again tapped into something that we're very we feel very passionate about that we want to get out there quickly because we think there's a lot of mis miscommunication out there a lot of misunderstanding of what exactly uh the demons can do will do and have done so, um, but that person in the film, I, I picked up on it. He seemed very tormented. So he, see, he was very compromised. So you, you have to imagine that he had mental illness playing a factor. He had anxiety, depression. He, he had let the demons in early on. Remember the demons come in in, in layers. It doesn't, it's not just one thing. It's not just one demon. It, it, it comes in in layers. And so he was so severely compromised and then was eventually taken over by possession. 
Absolutely. Now, like you had mentioned, it's, it's, it's a very rare for people to be possessed and probably uh, just as rare to encounter somebody that's possessed, though perhaps maybe uh, not as rare as we would think. But mm-hmm. we would much more um, be tempted in the normal means uh, being perhaps having uh, experiencing uh, oppression or simply maybe just temptation um, because temptation comes from the world, the flesh, and the devil. So it could be from the devil. So how do we uh, gird ourselves to protect ourselves mm-hmm. from those potential attacks from the devil? Mm-hmm. Great question, Adrian. Boy, I want to take you on the road with me. You're amazing. <laughs> okay, you that is amazing. And we didn't even we didn't even plan this ahead of time. You just knew to ask these questions. I believe those are those were Holy Spirit inspired questions. Um, what I would recommend for folks, uh, if you are Catholic, please um, wear a, a blessed um, crucifix or a, a, with a Saint Benedict medal in it. That would be great. Or Saint Amen. Benedict medal. Yes, yes, absolutely. And um, a miraculous medal. Also say the um, St. Michael prayer in the morning and the evening. Also say the um, the guardian angel prayer. I know we learned it as kids and it sounds really cute, but it's it's really very powerful because mm-hmm. you're 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 acknowledging the mission of the guardian angels. Um, make sure at one Hail Mary, one our, our Father is very, very powerful. How do we know that? Because Adam talks about it during during the solemn rite of exorcism. Um, it has been told to them. Remember, all all of heaven is kind of responding in these in these um, sessions, and um, and it's it's the the prayer, the Hail Mary, the Our Father, very powerful. Go to confession, please. Go to confession. Clear the channels. Clear it. So so you can ha- so you can have that abundance of grace. So go to confession. Um, stay away from anything that is associated with the occult. Stay away from anything that is that is foreign to you. Um, that you have you know when you learned as a child what what Catholicism is all about. If you see something else coming in from from an, a different angle and it's very it feels very foreign to you, stay away from it. Stay away. Even if somebody says, "Oh, it's so lucky, it's so magical, it's so this," no, it's probably going to be a portal for the demon, and that's dangerous. If you're not Catholic. Um, please become um, Catholic. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. But yes, and, Right. And please just, you know, deep prayer, get into scripture and stay very focused on on Jesus himself. Very important. So, hey, Debbie, this is Tito. I just have one quick question. Hi. What I'm familiar with with uh, holy water. What do we use with blessed salt? How do we use it? What is it for exactly? Mm -hmm. Sure. Same thing, Tito, with any of the sacramentals, but the holy water and blessed salt and blessed oil. Um, are very effective um, to really, uh, the best way I describe it, Tito, to, to folks is that it, it kind of blocks, it's like a, a, a shut door, ah. the door shuts. And and so it they, they don't, um, the demons do, do not want to be around things that point to God. They don't want to, they, they, they go away from it. So we also recommend that if you go into like, um, if you're traveling and you go into a hotel room, Okay, you know, it bring holy water, bring mm-hmm. blessed salt, sprinkle it around. I mean, now the sacramentals, this is not superstitious. It really is um a vehicle to to be aware that God is in charge and to also understand that demons are also exist and that we are in a war. We have to really we can't get we can't get scared about this. We can't pull back. We got to go on the offensive and the sacramentals are are beautiful ways for us to always stay focused that God is in charge. We we depend on God. We rely on God and we believe we believe that um, we will be we will be protected from all of this. So um, there's there's more to say about the sacramentals, but I'm a big believer in blessed salt, holy water and Amen. blessed oil. I always mm-hmm. keep a, a, a flask you, of uh, of the of exercise salt with me, especially when I travel on planes, because I can <laughs> I can get the salt through security, but they'll take my water away. Uh, so I always keep a, a small flask of exercise salt with me whenever I travel. Uh, but that's going to be about all the time we have. Uh, but if you like to hear more, Debbie, where can people listen to you uh, about talking more about this? Well, definitely at Guadalupe Radio Network with the podcast that we have uh, done for a year, but also every Saturday 
um, at, you, you shared it earlier, Adrian, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern. We are live this weekend talking about levels of demonic activity. Amen. I just want to thank you guys so much for having me on. Absolutely. I really, really love your show. Thank you very much. God bless you. God love you. And that's going to do it. We're going into the, to the Fear and Trembling Game Show. Call now, 877-757-9424. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question if you're a non-Catholic friend. Was the Catholic Church in existence as far back as the first three centuries? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, baseball. In September 1845, the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club was formally established and called baseball. Rules were set included a diamond-shaped infield, foul lines, and the three-strike rule. But seven years before that, in 1775, that game was already being played on schoolyards well before it was ever called baseball. Secondly, the Apostolic Father such as Tertullian, Clement, St. Ignatius, all wrote before 215 A.D. about the authority of the local bishop, and they used the name the Catholic Church, which already had the liturgy, the Eucharist, the readings, the relics, a hierarchy, and jurisdiction. And thirdly, my take. To fishermen, a dolphin was just a big fish until they were termed dolphins, but they were always dolphins. And baseball was baseball well before it was termed baseball. And you will love this. The early church was the Catholic Church well before Constantine the Great, the Nicene Creed, and your church history book. Ever feel like life's just too much? Maybe it's time for a change. God offers us relief and hope. So if you're feeling like you need more peace today, begin at catholicscomehome.com. I used to wonder if God really cared about me. Then I started praying and going to church. I realized that God in my life was the difference between occasionally being happy and finding lasting joy. If you're looking for something more, check out catholicscomehome.com. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. <laughs> the Catholic Trivia Game Show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. That's 877-757-9424. <laughs> Eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. That's the number to call to be part of the game show Fear and Trembling, where we give out prizes and you could win. How do you win, you may ask? Well, it's very simple. All you have to do is dial eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. That's the number to call, 877-757-9424. We always take the first caller, so call now, and you can be our contestant because we all have uh, several opportunities to win this week's prize. So you're maybe calling, okay, well, what am I calling into? What's going on here? I don't know what this is. It's very, very simple. We have a Catholic trivia game show. I have three Catholic trivia questions here in front of me. And the trick is, I'm not going to ask you the questions. No, I'm going to ask Tito the questions, and Tito's going to give me an answer, and it's going to be your job to tell me whether or not he is right or whether or not he is wrong. And every right answer will go into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Tito, what can they win? Thank you, Adrian. They can win a CDT coffee prize pack. With that prize pack, you receive a coffee cup signed by Adrian and myself, as well as two books, one from Fulton Sheen and the other one from an, uh, an author I cannot recall at this moment. So, yes, a CDT prize pack. All right. A CDT prize pack is the prize for this week. Uh, so make sure you call in 877 757 Nine four two four. That's eight seven 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 five seven ninety four twenty four. And we always take the first caller, so make sure you hop on, and we'll have a great time. And even if you don't know anything about these questions, I guarantee you, you're going to be able to have a great opportunity to win. Because even if you just guess, it's a fifty fifty chance of you being right. Because all you have to do is say whether or not Tito is right or Tito is wrong. And that will give you an opportunity to win this week's prize. So call now 877 757 9424. 877 757 9424. So let me go check over at the phone lines. And it looks like we have an opportunity because 
the phone lines are completely open. So the next person to pick up the phone and dial 877-757-9424 will be our contestant today. So make sure you dial that out. 877-757-9424. I'm looking over at the questions today, and it looks like... Hmm, we got at least one tricky question, but it looks like the other two are fairly easy. So it's going to be a all easy questions, uh, mostly easy questions today. Uh, two, two easy, one difficult questions. So I'm sure it's going to be a great time. And if you are thinking, oh, Adrian, I can't just call in. I have, uh, I'm driving. And so I can't just dial that number. Well, what you can do is you can actually go to our website, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. And there, grnonline.com forward slash CDT, you can find all of the information about the show and our phone number is listed there. So you can always write that phone number down and call in uh, early, put us on speed dial. Uh, but joining us right now is Carrie. Good morning to you, Carrie. Good morning. Uh, where are you calling from, Carrie? Lugenbach, Texas. Ah, Lugenbach, Texas. <laughs> Over there with Whaling and the Boys? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I, I've never been to Lugenbach, Texas, but I've always wanted to go solely because of the song. So uh, what, is it, what, what is Lugenbach, Texas known for other than being famous from being in songs? There's a dance hall and a little beer joint. So you're saying uh, I should come out there. So I can uh, go country dancing is what you're saying. You may do so, yes, sir. All right, all right. Then that's the plan. So where are you off to this morning? I'll go to the ranch and try to ram up some calves. That's awesome. Praise be to God. That's really cool. Uh, nice. One, one day, one day I'm going to get a ranch and uh, and find myself a, a, nice, uh, a nice lady and settle down and and maybe have some cows and some horses of my, of my own, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll that see. would be fun. There you go. But uh, it's great. Are you familiar with the game, Carrie? Yes, sir. Awesome. So you know Tito can be a little tricky. So you got to keep. You got to stay vigilant. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Then let's do it. Let's begin with question number one, Tito. I'm ready. You're ready. Then let's do it. Question number one. Um. In what century did Franciscan missionary friar Giovanni da Monte Corvino arrive in Asia? Friar Monte Corvino. Uh, normally, I would miss a question like this, but uh, I'm a huge history fan, and I've been reading medieval stuff. It seems as if the 12th, 13th, and 14th, centuries, especially the 12th and 13th, were one of the best eras of the church with Dominic and Francis. But with this fella, uh, it was uh, the 13th century. It's just a gold mine of saints. Okay, so you're going with 13th century. Yes, sir. Well, I did mention that the, there's going to be one tricky question of these. And so, Carrie, question number one. The question is, in what century did Franciscan missionary friar Giovanni de Monte Corvino arrive in Asia? Tito seems to think it's the 13th century. Uh, what say you carry? 15 seconds on the clock. Usually I agree with him, but this time I'll disagree. Are you sure you're going to disagree? I changed my mind. I won't agree with him. <laughs> he says he agrees. He says he agrees. There, there we go. There we go. Praise you to God, Carrie. Uh, you can tell that Carrie is a veteran because he uh, very he quickly picked up on the cues. Uh, so you know he's a veteran. Uh, very, very good, Carrie. Good you, job, uh, Carrie. You, you got your at one for one so far. That's a 100% success rate. Are you ready for question number two? Yes, sir. All right. Well, just let you know the rest of these questions, I got to say, it's gonna. It's, they're pretty easy. They're pretty easy. So uh, trend number one was the hardest one. So let's go to question number two. Tito, question number two for you. All right. Is baptism a rite of purification? Purification, a rite of purification. Baptism. Well, 
we to right to, ha to have the right form, you need water. So uh, that would imply cleanliness, which would re need to purity. So yes, um, that would be my my logical conclusion. I should know this, but I don't. But I'm just going to go with logic and go with that. It's yes, it is a rite of purification. Okay. All right. The question is, is baptism a rite of purification? And, um, well, I mean, if baptism cleanses you of original sin, one might use the word purifies you. So 15 seconds of the clock. Carrie, what say you? Is the answer yes or is the answer no? Is Tito right or is he wrong? Uh, what say you, Carrie, from Lugenbach, Texas? The answer is yes. The answer is yes, he says. Way to go. Praise be to God. Easy peasy. I told you that the question was going to be easy. I knew you'd get it. Uh, but the, yes, baptism, a wonderful, and some might argue, is the most important sacrament because it uh, purifies you of original sin. So there you go. There you go. Good All job. All righty, Carrie. Are you ready for question numero trace? Ready. Yes, sir. Uh, do you know what language trace is? German. Ah! Whoa! We have a smart man over here. We uh, My he clearly is a man of great intelligence, a man of uh, great renown. I'm sure. I, I would have fell off my shoes if he said hi, German. Fall <laughs> off your shoes? <laughs> I've never heard that anybody say. Okay, question number three. The question on the board is: When does the church commemorate Jesus' Last Supper with his apostles? When? Uh, that would be Holy. Friday or or uh, Good Good Friday. A good Friday. You're yeah, saying. yeah. Okay. Good Friday. Yep. Okay. All right, Carrie. This question uh, seems to be a very straightforward question. So the question on the board is: When does the church commemorate Jesus's Last Supper with his apostles? Fifteen seconds of the clock. Tito says Holy Friday. What say you, Carrie? Is he right or is he wrong or is he trying to trick you? What say you, Carrie, from Lugenbach, Texas? Holy smokes, it's Holy Thursday. Holy smokes, it's Holy oh. Thursday. He says, way to go, Carrie. That is correct. It Good is, job. in fact, Holy Thursday. That is the day. Though, it's uh, White Wolf in our comment section let us know last time this question came around. He was like, technically speaking, the uh, there was a, he ate with the with the apostles after the resurrection, so technically it's not his last supper. It's his last supper before his death. I'm like, okay, all right, technicality, whatever. That's Is he a correct. Kind of That's lawyer true. or something? Uh, but way to go, Carrie. You got three for three. Oh, How do you feel? Cool. Retired history teacher. There you go. Oh. There you go. Retired history teacher. Praise be to God. Yes, but, I love history. Thank you for your work for your, for all your years of uh, serving the, the kids at school. Well, the Thank well, you, Carrie. Sir. God bless you. Uh, how do you feel? Wunderbar, yeah. <laughs> good there, Spanish. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Praise be to God. Well, that, they, let me uh, make sure we get your contact information. So stay on hold. Don't hang up. Sometimes people will uh, hang up on us, but uh, stay on the line so we can get your contact information. So if we draw your name, we can make sure to send you the prize. Uh, but God bless you. God love you. And have a blessed day. Thank you. Y'all too. Absolutely. I'm going to put you on hold. And that's going to do it for the radio side. If you can join us, then I'd say hop on to our social media streams. Go to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Rumble, Odyssey, and you can hang out with us right there. Just look up Catholic Drive Time on any of those platforms, and you can interact with us directly. We'd be very excited to have a conversation with you right there. Whatever it is you want to talk about, you lead the conversation. Just let us know. But if not, and we'll see you back Monday or not Monday. I don't know what I'm saying. Tomorrow morning, Wednesday, June 7th. We'll see you back tomorrow morning, Wednesday at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern across the Guadalupe radio network. And remember, this is the month dedicated to the Sacred Heart. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And let's say over and over again today and every day this month, Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time.
time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. And welcome back to the Catholic Drive Time Show. Welcome to the after show. Let's see. Camera's being funny. Let's see if I can fix that. There we go. All right, guys. Good morning to you, uh, Anthony Stein. Welcome to the show. Anthony Stein is on uh, the YouTube chats. Tell Anthony, I would, uh, I'd, I'm trying to get Anthony to agree to, um, to be a regular guest. So everybody uh, tell Anthony Stein uh, she should come on as a regular guest. We have um, maybe, maybe on Monday mornings. Maybe uh, Monday mornings you can hop on with us and join us. That might be a good time. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, what's, uh, let's see. What's the word? Uh, Nick says, as far as I know, the Sacred Heart Co-Cathedral in Houston used mead for the consecration. Is mead acceptable? No, I don't have substantial proof that mead was used. Uh, no. No. Really? They use mead? There's no way. There's no way they use mead. I would have to check that. I don't know. There's no way they use mead. If they use mead, I, I would be absolutely flabbergasted. It has to be grape-based, and, and mead is made out of honey. So... Unless, unless mead has, uh, is mead made with, made with grapes? I'm pretty sure it's made with, with honey, right? I really hope you're, you're wrong there. It's made with honey. I'm pretty certain. I have a friend, uh, who, uh, who makes uh, mead uh, from his home, <laughs> like people brew a uh, beer, and it is honey. And uh, it's a tricky process, but it can be done. And it can be quite delicious if done properly, but uh, you really have to be good at it. Well, I really hope you're wrong, Nick, because that's really concerning. Because, um, no, yeah, if mead is not made with grapes, uh, I'm not an expert on on alcoholic beverages, but assuming that mead is made with no wine, and even if it was made with with grapes, it's like infused with honey. It's like a lot of it's honey. Um, I would assume that it's invalid material. Hmm. Yikes, that's concerning. That's suspicious. Uh, okay, so if anybody gets any information on that, I'd love to uh, follow up on that because that would be a, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, Cole Ken says, "Good morning. I took your advice and sent a two-page letter to our bishop, Bishop Anthony Taylor, asking him to speak out against the LA Dodgers and the Sisters of Petrol Indulgence. Nothing yet. Amen. Amen. I'm glad that you reached out to them. At least uh, now, at least you can they can say, hey." I mean, we we've said it, we've uh, we've we're out here and we have requested it, so no one can say that. Oh, I didn't say anything because no one even mentioned it to me. So that's a a good place to start with us. Uh, let's see. Lori says, if you travel for work or vacation, how can you know the priest? So if I don't know the priest, I know the community. So I attend masses that I to with communities that I trust. So, for instance, if it's uh, a FSSP parish, I'm like, okay, yeah, I trust the FSSP priest. If it's like the Institute of Christ the King, I'm like, yeah, I'll trust the Institute of Christ the King. Good Shepherd. Um, Institute of the Good Shepherd. They're, uh, they're a good community. So those I would tend to trust. Uh, communities like that I tend to trust. Uh, it just depends. So it just depends on where I'm going. And typically, I don't really travel anywhere I avoid traveling to places where I can't get to. I, the first thing I look for when I go and I travel is where am I going to go to mass? And so I look at that first and foremost. What, what? And if I can't, then I'll make sure that at least on the Sunday when I'm traveling, I'll be somewhere where there's near a mass that I can go to. What website do you use 
for that. I know there's a new one. Well, it's about a year old. I go to Latin Mass Finder. Oh, okay. There's also reverentmass.com. Oh, yeah. Well, I just go to, yeah. I just go, go to latinmass.com. Latin yeah. That's where I go. Uh, Sonia says, um, good after show topic. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good after show topic. Yeah, I mean, that's just, um, I just don't trust. I just don't trust priests. I, I've been in so many situations, and I'm talking about confession, where when it comes to the Eucharist, how could you ever even know? You don't know what father's drinking and what father's putting into the chalice. You know what father, where father got his host from. And if I just don't, if I don't know the priest, I mean, I have no idea what these priests are doing. How many times have we seen stories recently? There's been like three and that's just the ones that we know about that got publicity. How many times have a priest been invalidly ordained or baptized or confirmed that's so concerning. This is a very concerning situation. I remember I about seven years ago or so in Australia, I don't know which diocese, but they were doing the wrong form of the baptism. People would say in the name of the Holy Redeemer, uh, the Sophia and something or other, and then bless with water. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what the final conclusion was, but man, that was a huge mess when they were going silly with, with the wording of, of the Blessed Trinity. Yeah, I mean, if I, if, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just very, it's very, very bad. You know, I think, I don't know. Sometimes I say, like, I was going through a stage for a while because um, where I was thinking about my own baptism, I was like, you know, I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe it would be better if I just uh, of got got conditionally baptized and maybe everybody should just get conditionally baptized. And especially uh, people who are going to get ordained. Eh, like maybe every priest should be conditionally baptized because it's just so much. It's just so bad out there. And I guess like if you know for sure, like you have video evidence of the things happening and or you know that the priest is a good priest, it's a totally different circumstance. But uh, otherwise, man, it's no bueno. It's no bueno. So... I don't know. It's pretty bad. Let's see. Uh, Tony says, what time should I wake up to call tomorrow morning? We're going to the airport tomorrow. Call in at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Central. Um, you can come in as early as 7 a.m. Wait on hold. Um, or call in once the game show starts. All up to you. Let's see. Sci-Fi Mike said, mead is not from grapes. Cannot be acceptable. There you go. Yeah, I don't know anything about mead. But if you have... A priest consecrating the host with me, that's, that's bad. That's called a problemo no bueno. Uh, so we just had a uh, special guest walk into the studio. Good morning to you, special guest. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, special guest. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, sorry, Rudy. I, I, I forgot your name, Rudy. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, that's all it was. Uh, it's forget I'm forgettable. Yeah, it was, so. I've, I've already forgotten. Only one person reached out to me, and they're like, why aren't you on the show anymore? I had a lot of just number of people reach out person. to me. Asking about you. I remember. I re I'll remember this oh, wow. forever. Uh, Sci-Fi Mike says, even a honey wine might be illicit, I think, but the article specifically called out sugar additives being invalid. So yeah, yeah, there you go. That's so concerning, man. So what was the deal with that? Was it because they were doing, they were passing out, distributing both species or no. they wanted to have a sweet the, wine for the people to enjoy? Or the, the wine that the priest was consuming was, um, was like infused or something. So who was making the purchase? Exactly. Who done it? Uh, it's the priest. Yeah, he the made pastor. the order. <laughs> yeah, he made the order. And it's it's like, let's see, they said the diocesan FAQ did not acknowledge the possibility that additional sugars might be added during the winemaking process, along with other additives, especially in states where winemaking is not heavily regulated. This is why most places, like in Houston, for instance, um, now obviously there, there tends to be regulations in dioceses. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a priest can do whatever he wants, um, but... If you go to the Catholic stores, the they Catholic sell stores, exactly. sacramental yep. wine, and they're especially made to special be, vineyard. Yeah, exactly. Same thing with the host. You can you can use technically any kind of bread, technically speaking, 
but the hosts are specifically made that we know they're valid and the hosts are actually specially made so that way when fractured it produces the least amount of uh, crumbs as possible. Hmm. So, did, did you know this is an odd fact in the qu province of Quebec in Canada, the French speaking citizens there, uh, they eat the host as a morning snack with their milk or tea. Like it's, an actual host? Like yeah. a consecrated no, host? No, not consecrated, but just an actual host. Oh, so like an un oh, unconsecrated. Okay. Yes, so yes. Nothing yes. Wrong like with a that. cracker? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I guess no problem with that. Yeah, they have that in Mexico too. They call them obleas. Really? Yeah, and they put a uh, caramel sauce in between and they make little sandwiches out of it. I did not know that. Like There's something every day. Macarons? Those Is things are delicious. I didn't know those were. Huh. My, I have a friend whose uh, whose aunt is a uh, nun who makes hosts. Oh, cool! And so she will send her bags of the corners uh, because they're they're round. <laughs> oh, so that's a lot right. Of yeah. And uh, and so she and I were hanging out one day. Uh, I think it was like our sophomore year of college, and she pulls out a bag of unconsecrated hosts that are like all in triangles. <laughs> and I was like, uh, what are you doing? She's like eating them like they're chips. Oh man. And I was like, I was like, what are you doing? Somehow that's still sacrilege. It's still, it feels weird. <laughs> it feels weird. It feels weird. Technically there's nothing wrong with it, but it's weird. It's weird. Yeah. I don't know. It's Do kind of weird. You know, the design on those hosts is a simple cross but they do have traditional hosts that are more elaborate with the sacred heart of Jesus or uh, the crown of thorns on there. And I learned about this about two months ago, reading Father John Hunwick's blog, that he's switching from the regular unconsecrated hosts to those more traditional. And the reason why most priests don't use the traditional hosts is more that... Expensive. Uh, that could be the case because of the design. He said it's because they crumble easier than a regular host. Really? Yeah. Hmm. There you go. Yeah, to make those designs, you have to have the dyes. And a lot of the time, you can't even find them. Because, you know, as after a certain period of time, I'm not going to mention when, but, <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of these things got thrown out. So, hard yeah. to find those. Uh, so let's see. Okay. Which is so, why you should support CatholicPrintingPress.com. So interesting. Doretta Garcia says, a friend of mine in Kansas City got kicked out of her parish for complaining and reporting that they were buying box wine for Mass because it was cheaper than the expensive real wine, I remember. They literally went to Walmart to get box wine for mass. Wow. That's crazy. You know what's funny? I actually kind of chuckled about this. I mean, it's bad, but I kind of chuckled because the uh, Diocese of Kansas City came out saying um, you can fulfill your Sunday obligation by going to the SSPX. And they said uh, that um, the SSPX are not in schism. Then they said, uh, but we highly recommend you not go to the SSPX. But now it comes out a couple weeks later that if you're going to the diocese, you yeah, are probably going to invalid masses. But if you're going to the SSPX, you're going to valid masses. <laughs> that yeah. is fun. I mean, let me tell you, <laughs> you know, uh, anything to save a buck, right? Anything so we could have that, that parish fair. But when it comes to the rights of God and what God deserves, we cut corners all the time. I had stories like that all the time. You know, I used to be a sacristan and... Uh, our chalices, all of our, our sacred vessels, they were just in such poor shape. And one day I went to the, the, the pastor and I said, hey, we really need to repair these things or at least get them replated. You know, it's very simple. We yeah. Send them out. We had two sets. So I said, you know, we'll do it in, in, in tiers. You know, we'll send the first set out. The ones we use for Easter, we'll send those first and, you know, get those done. He was like, you know, that's just not really what I'm interested in doing here. That's not what that's not what my plan is here for the parish. And I said, what is your plan? He's like, well, I want to have good music here. I want to really invest in, in the experience of the mass. And that was it. I couldn't do it anymore. Oh, wow. I, I said, you know, I'm, I think I'm in the wrong place here. I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. Oh, run away. Yeah. Is it called a community and not a church? Yes, actually it was. And and that was another thing that bugged me. It was the Catholic community of, I'm not going to say where. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's usually a red flag for me. Yes. <laughs> for, for me too. Uh, yeah. Sonia says, I don't trust a lot of priests for so many reasons, but Adrian, what about the question of not attending mass being a mortal sin? Should one attend mass even if the priest is not trustworthy? Yes. So the answer is, uh, there's two different questions here. Is not attending mass a mortal sin? 
uh, yes, every Sunday of the year, you are obligated to attend Holy Mass. So that is a obligation that is according to um, the third commandment being fulfilled in particular law set out by the church. So the commandment of God is to keep holy the Lord's day. And so the church then articulates that to keep holy the Lord's day is to attend Holy Mass. So that's why it's something that could be dispensed. So if you are, um, cause the, vi- the violation of keeping Holy the Lord's day cannot be dispensed no matter what you have to keep Holy the Lord's day. But for instance, during COVID priest, the bishops dispensed of attending Holy Mass. That does not dispense the obligation for keeping holy the Lord today, though. So you still have to keep the day holy. Now, for instance, if you're sick, you don't have to attend holy mass and it won't be a sin. And so there are things that dispense you from it. A impossibility of attending mass will then dispense you from attending holy mass on a Sunday. So for instance, if the nearest mass to you is five hours away, you're trapped somewhere and there's no way for you to, it's impossible to get there or it's a Sunday. And then all of a sudden a hurricane hits or tornado hits, well, now you can't leave your house. So it's a physical impossibility if you get to Mass. You're not committing a mortal sin. You're dispensed. Then the question becomes a moral possibility. So then if it's a moral impossibility, meaning let's say the, the only church in town was a, was a clown Mass, was a, it was a Mass <laughs> where, the, where the, the priest shows Iconic. up wearing a red nose and big shoes and he's using uh, all sorts of crazy things, but you're like, oh, it's probably valid. He floats um, in because he's got he's so got many wires. balloons, no, and so the balloons yikes. are holding him up, and he's floating in <laughs> through the aisle. Yikes. If that was the only mass available. And they've got clown uh, liturgical dancers. Then you would not be obligated to attend mass. They're actually mimes. <laughs> so <laughs> Balloons attached to their wrists. <laughs> in, in that circumstance, it would be a moral impossibility because attending that mass would be offensive to God. Mm -hmm. Um, and therefore you should uh, not attend. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a uh, dubious question. It's a kind of a question of conscience and the question of your own personal prudence, uh, to kind of parse out. Uh, But generally speaking, yes, you do have a moral obligation to attend mass on Sunday and you would be a mortal sin to not attend mass. But in particular circumstances, you might be dispensed, but I can't articulate that unless you I knew your exact circumstances. So yeah, and if I mean if you know that that you know your your local mass is probably invalid, go just else. go somewhere else. Yeah, you know, and there's there's probably several <laughs> other parishes around you within an hour drive. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. Adrian, since the debacle from Kansas City, have you investigated your 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 uh, Annunciation Catholic community to see if they have the valid wine served there? I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be concerned. You wouldn't be concerned? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't bother. I, I don't think Father would. Uh, Father Felix would uh, use invalid matter. How, how about you, Rudy, at Regina Chelli uh, Catholic Community? Oh, uh, just doxed me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Am I worried Sorry. about the wine? No, I'm not no. worried about Okay. Wine. No. But, you know, you know what does bug me, though? What's and that? I'm not saying Regina Chelli does this, but... Um, there are certain parishes that use white wine for the consecration. And oh. That's weird to me. Well, that's weird. You're fine to do it. Yeah, the reason it's why totally they do fine it, to do it, but do it's you know weird why? to me. No, it's because it's easier it's, to palate because it stains um, the it stains uh, less. It stains the um, the red wine stains uh, the purificator. Yeah. yeah, and so it's like you have to have like tons of purificators because you can never get the wine completely off of them. Yeah, so and, and, and I I'm a stickler. You know, some people use cotton. It's got to be linen. It's got to be linen, bros. If it does I'm the have pope, to be linen. If I'm the pope. No, it, le- it doesn't yeah. have to be linen. I think it could be a blend. Okay, that might be the case, but it still has to be linen. Could, yeah. um, can you use crystal vessels instead of go- the gold vessels for the... For the... Ask uh, Cardinal Mahoney. For the wine? If, no. No? No, everything. It has to be precious. Thank you, Rudy. It has to be precious <laughs> Thank metal. Thank you. I, <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to get to. You beat me to the hey, punch. But actually, you know, I had a friend who was from Hawaii, and he told me that they would use koa wood for... The sacred vessels, because it was a rare wood, rare, quote unquote. Yeah, it's like oak wood, uh, but much more rare and stronger. Um, so I'm surprised that they, you, you, I didn't know they were allowed to use koa, but yeah, the koa is a very prestigious uh, wood out in Hawaii. It's very hard to find. So that would make sense if, if they would use it, but I'd, I prefer gold plated vessels. Yeah. And Doretta says, I have a feeling that this wine thing will blow up even more once people look into other churches. Yeah. I agree, especially since the quotation was parishes, 
not yeah. a particular priest, but parishes. And so I'm sure this is happening all over America. Don't get scrupulous, but do your research, I would say. Yeah, but stay informed. Uh, Sci-Fi Mike says, I imagine the mass was valid because there was indeed unleavened bread. So the mass would not be valid. However, the consecration of the bread would be va- would be validly consecrated, but the mass would be invalid because you cannot sacrifice the mass unless the priest consumes both uh, under both species. That's required for, for a mass to be valid. And uh, the consecration of the host would have happened, but the consecration of the wine would not have happened. So you could say you have to be make a distinction between a valid mass and a valid consecration. So the valid consecration of the host happened, a valid consecration of the wine did not happen, a valid mass did not happen. Uh, Sci-Fi Mike said, I was once at a mass where the hosts were consecrated alongside bread that must have had leaven received off of what must have been this unconsecrated bread. Oh, re- okay, so that's what you're talking about. So uh, it is not required for the validity of the sacrament that it be unleavened. Really? Yes. Huh. It can be any kind of bread as long as it is majority gluten. Uh, it has gluten in it. And there is debate on whether or not if it has like things in it, if it's valid or not. So like if it's raisin bread, is it valid? Um, that's debated. Uh, but if it's leavened versus unleavened, you're fine. Uh, in fact, in the Eastern church, they use leavened bread exclusively. And so the reason why they use leavened bread exclusively is because they say that the Eucharist is the risen Lord. And so it's symbolic of the risen Lord. Whereas in the West, we use unleavened bread because it's more of a focus on the passion. That's funny. That's actually why I thought you couldn't use leavened bread. Oh, that's interesting. Is because the Easterns were using it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Eastern Catholics uh, use it. So. The Easterns don't they use a big pot full of consecrated wine with chunks of the leavened bread inside it, and they yeah. serve you with a spoon? I think I've seen that I've, too. Yeah, I've seen that too. I, I thought that they dipped it in there. I thought they used a spoon and they put it in there and they dipped yeah. it. I don't yeah, think they, they just like they, leave it. I don't think they just pour it into the. Oh, okay. I think, well, at least whenever, I, whenever I've been to the Eastern Mass, I've never. I've just seen pictures. Um, yeah, when I, when I've been, and I'm sure it's different versus different communities. I'm sure, um, and at different rites in the Eastern Rite, because there's like several rites in the East. Uh, but the ones I've been to, they've got a spoon and they get the leavened bread on the spoon, and then they'll dip it into the wine, uh-huh. and then they'll pour it over. So that's the way they, that I've seen it done. Interesting. So. Wow. Maybe other people do it differently, but I don't know. Uh, let's see. Jane says, hi, Rudy. Jane? Good yep. morning, Jane. Let's Sci-Fi see. Mike had this incredible video, by the way, on the Insider Chat, where a bird landed on him. Oh, and yeah. was just kind of hanging out. And that was wild. <laughs> he's, 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 like, <laughs> he's like, Rudy, this never happens to you? That Dude. has <laughs> never happened to me in my entire life, as much as I would want it. In fact, the direct opposite always happens to me. I can I can get like I don't know within fifty feet of a bird, which is absurd. That's pretty far, and they get skittish and fly away. So, so, no. I did. Um, is it your aftershave? You think? I don't know. I did a. Uh, I went to my crunchy boots. I, I've been <laughs> I've been attacked by birds. Really? So I made a joke. I said uh, birds. They just ran on me to pull my hair. Well, that wasn't actually a joke. It's actually true. What, like grackles or? No, like, I don't I have no idea. Are I don't know. Blackbirds? I have no clue. California I don't know. condor. I was walking, <laughs> I was walking outside my house and apparently there was like, they were building a nest in our tree. And I guess they thought that I was like going to attack the nest or something. Cause I was just walking underneath the tree to get into my house. And the bird attacked me and it started yanking on my hair. Nice. And I was like, I'm going to die. <laughs> what if he wasn't attacking you? What if he's like, wow, I like this guy's hair. He'd make I, a it great would nest. make a great nest. <laughs> I think I'm, I th- I'd be like, dang. Great nest. My, my dad, my parents would agree. I saw this cool video the other day of uh, birds plucking the fur out of a, a deer. And they were using it for nests. And the deer Yikes. was just like, take it. <laughs> Living the life. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, they're young starlings, and I think they had no fear, says Sci-Fi Mike. Oh, starling. Oh, then it was a female, because it was brown. Mm. Nice. I would not know that, so there you go. I like those birds. They have an interesting call. Just looking for food, says Sci-Fi Mike. Uh, Well, look for food elsewhere. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Uh, My mom would be like, yeah, your hair is a bird's nest. Go cut it. Uh, (laughs) Let's see. The uh, Alaric says the vessel should be precious metal also because it is less porous. So true. Yeah, mm. that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alberto says I went to a Wesleyan chapel on invitation of an old French 
and he did grape juice for the Eucharist. He's the pastor. Well, and the little Wesleyans are not even Catholic anyway, so yeah, their, their sacraments are invalid already. Uh, let's see. Alberto says our priest did white thick sliced with butter. What? Oh come on, dude! He's kidding. Are you joking? He's got to be joking. No way. That's you're joking, right? There's some blessed butter on it. Yikes. That's so cringe. I'm so I'm so over it. I'm so over it. Let's see. Looking in the Telegram chat, anything interesting? People laughing at people at birds ripping my hair out. I appreciate that, guys. <laughs> um, Eileen, good morning to you. Lee, good morning to you. Tammy, Clarissa, Nick, Mike, Damon, good morning to all y'all. Uh, let's see. Sci-fi Mike says, but the article does give a shout out to my hometown and former bishop. My jaw dropped when I thought about all the missed intentions. Think about all the funeral masses that didn't happen. <gasps> I didn't think about that. Dude. Good news. Well, I think God probably honors the intention now. Yeah, like like no. if <laughs> you don't think so? No, because you you're offering you're offering the holy sacrifice of the mass for the intention. Now it, you prayed for that intention, but you didn't offer mass for that intention. Yeah, but could it be similar to like a spiritual baptism? You you, you intend to, you want to, yeah, you can't get to it, about. and then you get killed in war, and, and you meant to get the baptism, and God said you were converted. It's called a spiritual baptism. Uh, baptism of desire. Yeah, baptism of desire. Thank you. Um, like a mass of desire. <laughs> that doesn't exist. It well, doesn't exist. It's not a category. It's I not mean, a thing. What I'm saying, though, is these people aren't culpable. They didn't know that. Yeah. Right? It's not your... So you didn't commit a sin, but you also didn't get the, the grace of getting it. Well, like, we don't know like, that. Like getting, like getting an invalid baptism, for instance. You didn't commit a sin by being invalidly baptized. Yeah, but I'm saying we don't know that. I think that that God can work outside of the sacrament if there if we're in this particular circumstance. Like I'm not saying like mm, oh well know. go and be a Buddhist or whatever or like Thomas Merton, but like I think maybe these guys didn't know that. And they're probably getting some grace. Are they getting some grace? Yeah, sure, because you prayed. <laughs> you said prayers. You said prayers for that intention, but you didn't offer mass. I mean, it's just yeah, it's no, very. I, I mean, that. it's very. I get that. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry you either did or didn't do something and so if you didn't receive the sacrament you didn't receive the sacrament now you might have uh made a spiritual communion it'd be a very good aid in spiritual communion but it still wouldn't be offering mass you would have offered a spiritual communion let's look at the bright side maybe all of these people who typically receive sacrilegiously because they haven't gone confession in a long time they actually weren't committing a sin. <laughs> so. Though you you would have uh, committed a sin of desire because you intended to receive communion in a state of mortal sin. True presumption. So, mm -hmm. um, so the uh, the God understands thing works both ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, Dorada Garcia says, "Oh no, the dreaded God understands thing." The boomer motto. <laughs> <laughs> it's over for you, Rudy. You're Look, officially a boomer. I mean, What's I am getting older. But... Moralistic therapeutic deism? Is that, <laughs> is that what Ross Duthod calls it? Let's see. Uh, Alberto says, you know you could be baptized in another Trinitarian water baptism church and still receive confirmation as a Catholic. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So if, you, uh, if you're baptized validly, you're baptized into the Catholic church. And the uh, your confirmation, all you have to do is, it, well, you could just be confirmed, but typically you have to be uh, go through RCA, which Alberto said, yeah, after RCA, RCA or something equivalent. Uh, Paul says getting grace, just not supernatural grace by the invalid sacrifice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The lost Creole says actually not receiving a proper confession could be damning. Well, that's definitely damning. It's definitely unless you made a perfect act of contrition, um, then yeah, it is damning because you're not. Forgiven of your sins. This is why it's a big deal. This is why the church has put so many safeguards in regards to the sacraments. And what did the priest do today? Nothing. They do not follow them. Clown masses running around. Gee. I would, I mean, it's just bad. It's just bad. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Liturgical dancing clowns. <laughs> <laughs> Stick, I can't get that off my head. Yeah. I'm sorry for the visual. You're welcome. All right, that's going to do it. Uh, so I'll see you guys tomorrow. Well, bye. Well, bye. Till next time. <laughs> <laughs>
Till well, next time. I'm, I, like, I'm like how nobody asked, why is Rudy back on the show? Nobody, nobody's asking. No, no questions. No comments. Pray for us. He's we, very uh, active on Telegram. We're gonna go that furniture shopping it. today. So, all right, Keep guys. Keep us in your prayers. We're gonna God have to survive you. IKEA. Survive oh goodness IKEA. gracious! Are we going to IKEA? Really? Spaghetti okay, and meatballs. Okay, I was like, I, I hate IKEA, man. Uh, they do have good Swedish meatballs, but they do not. Their store is like a maze. It's horrible. All right, God bless you. God love you. We'll see you back tomorrow, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern, across the Guadalupe Radio Network. And God love you. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.